but we do want to um, um, start on time. Um, yeah, welcome everybody um, to this session. It's great to see um, some faces that we saw in, in kind of previous sessions today and, um, and some new faces as well. So, so warm welcome to everybody um, and thank you for joining. Um, my name is Sarah Galvin. I am the um, director of an organization called PayPal, and I'm also um, been on the um, Sweden board for several years. Um, so I'll be kind of running us through things today. Um, so we'll start with um, the kind of Zoom etiquette, um, just to quickly run over that. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this slide before, um, but you know, include your organization name and your name in, in your name. Do that in the top right hand corner of three dots. Um, please feel free to use the chat box, you know, comment on what people are saying. Let's keep this quite interactive. Um, um, yeah, share the details of your organisations, um, and if you could direct questions to Hannah or Jesse, um, to Sweden, I think it's, is it Sweden, Hannah, that they direct questions to? Yeah, if you direct questions to Sweden, then we'll we'll manage that there. Um, or just put them in the chats for everyone, to be honest, we, we can manage that. Um, please do keep your video on if you can. I know I've presented in, in calls like this before, and it's, it's hard when uh, you can't see a lot of faces. So it's really nice to see people's faces, um, if you can possibly put your video on. Um, and we are recording the session. It will be available after the event on the website. So, um, so yeah, so... Brilliant. So any questions on um, on the kind of logistics, please just and Jesse. Um, so we're here to talk about being good partners. Um, and I just wanted to open by saying it was really interesting um, to go to Amanda um, Cozy McWashi session, um, who's the chief exec of Christian Aid. Um, on um, yesterday, and she talked about being everyday partners to those who work with around the world. And I think that really stuck with me, that concept of being an everyday partner. Um, but I've also just come from the session, and I'm sure many of you have as well, on um, the UK aid cuts. And um, we talked in that session, obviously, about fundraising and, and the difficulties of that and what you know, I think is so difficult and has certainly been challenging for my organisation of the last year and a half is, you know, we lost money through the cuts to UK Ed, and kind of, though we have long-term partnerships, it's been really difficult over the last 18 months to, to sustain those, to maintain that trust, um, to build, to continue to build partnerships when, you know, we can't travel, um, and also against a backdrop of, um, you know, reducing aid spend and COVID disruption. And um, so I so I really feel like it's been a super tough year in terms of how we maintain those partnerships. Um, so yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting time for really maintaining partnerships around the world. Um, so I'm not going to um, talk for very long. I'm going to introduce our, our great panel. Um, so we, we're going to start off kick off with Palash um, Kamruz, Kamruzaman um, from the University of South Wales. Um, so Palash is a senior lecturer at, in social policy at the University of South Wales and have done extensive research around participation in policymaking, aid ethno ethnographies, displacement, civil society and extreme poverty. And he's currently researching roles of national development experts in global development. And he's passionate about um, diversity and inclusion in the aid sector. And um, so I'll hand over to, to Palash. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was so very kind. I was thinking like, you know, is it me or you're talking about somebody else? So very kind of you to say that. Um, yes, um, as Sarah was saying, but you know, I work on my, one of my research focuses on um, aid expertise, so experts coming from Global South and experts who travel from, let's say, this part of the world or from the other side of the Atlantic, right? So I'm trying to explore the relationships between the expertise. And in <clears throat> covering the overarching theme of today's panel, that how we can be good partners to implement to implementing organizations, um, I think like, you know, what I will focus on from my research on this, um, the some research I've done in Ghana and in Nigeria and in Bangladesh. So it is quite a challenge to keep everything in seven to 10 minutes time. And I'll focus very briefly about like a couple of key issues, which I think is like, you know, the um, 
I think is important to be able to a good partner. All right. So I do not have like you know, huge acronyms like you know P R G A C B P R. I mean, if you know like you know participatory research and gender analysis, or like you know, community-based participatory research or sort analysis, I don't have these acronyms, right? I'll just like you know put this plain and simple. Two main ingredients I would think is respect and humility, and. Um, on that note of acronyms, you know, sometimes the acronyms can cause huge confusion among the local partners because don't think the local partners, all the local partners have equal level of consciousness. The CEO of local partnering organizations might be different from the program managers or the project officers who may not have any ideas of those terms. They're there to do the like, you know, day jobs there, right? So in terms of respect, I think like, you know, we know these terms and I do not ask, I'm not asking for a lot. I'm not going to say like, no, please do to respect your partners or we should respect our partners equally. We know that the game of international development, the industry is a like a you know, power game based on the power relationship of who gives aid and who receives aid. Obviously like you know, who pays the piper often calls the shot, right? So in respecting like, you know, them as they are, the knowledge they have, the expertise they have, the experience they have, the life experiences they have with the particular society, if we could respect that, I think like, you know, they will understand that this is being respected and appreciated and they have more to engage and provide to the project. To sum up, like, you know, to, to, to give you some examples on that, like, you know, so when I was working on, I mean, my work from Nigeria, like, you know, so ActionAid was having, like, you know, what you call having some feedback from, like, these you know, partnering organizations. And one of the partner organizations tried to score from one to 10 basis, like, you know, what ActionAid gave. So ActionAid, um, the partner organizations, I'm not naming anybody, so partner organizations was telling, like, you know, we have scored you three. Because We'd have liked to score you zero if possible, but the reason you scored you three because some of you are good. So there is this huge differentiation. We should not generalize that you know, all of us do suffer from this like you know, superior syndrome. There are some colleagues who are very polite. This is what, and I read from them, that you have some staff who really maintain the participatory values and community values. That you know we are here, you're humble and you are very engaging, but we gave you three because some of your staff are very arrogant and they are not leaving out the values of mutual respect, no humility on their engagement. So what I'm trying to focus here is that the local partner agencies, they are well aware, like they understand, they can sense the partner attitude of the partners and they can respond to it given, to the, given the opportunity. And in terms of respecting their own ideologies, own values and expertise, the focus of my work, I feel it is important not to think that, you know, because we give money and we know everything and what has worked, let's say in one part of the world should work in another part of the world. What may have worked in Ghana will definitely not work in Ecuador. Maybe, maybe it will not, maybe it will, but we should not be fixated in our ideas that you know, it will definitely work. Why you don't understand because this has worked in Ghana and it should work here. And I could just say like, you know, what I found out in terms of like, you know, in Ghana's case, one of the respondents who was working for one of the UN organizations, my respondent was saying that, look, I had an issue with a foreign expert and I was probing further why. And they were saying, look, there are some of them who are good, but many of them who just downplay anything African. So the effect is there is too, like no indigenous incorporation into the development framework that we emphasize and implement even though we talk about like you know, local ownership and local development. Right? So they're like you know, really well known, they're really well versed, and they were very bold to say to me. And they say, like, you know, they, when you get some of those who outrightly reject anything African, they say, like, you know, they'll be like you know, looking at you, they will outrightly reject anything you suggest in a subtle form by looking down on your work just because you're a Ghanaian and he or she is from abroad from the donor country. This is not this is not like a good way of like a partnering to say. In terms of like you know respect and humility, so I said respect. Other other aspect I'd like to mention here is like the humility. The humility is like you know to have an open outlook and to learn to have the ability to approach to ability to learn from their knowledge, which is based from indigenous community or the local community, 
the lived experience they have from that community and working because donor projects, often our partnerings are like in a short term. Trust me, they have developed that this agency that they could go very quickly that, you know, project will come, project will go, but we will stay here. So the temporary fix, short term occupation, they're well aware of that. But if you respect their expertise, that would be like you know, really appreciated. And if we could allow them to flourish and give input based on this expertise, just let me tell you one quote, one views, like rather than a quote from one of the Bangladeshi colleagues I worked with. The idea was that, look, it is important that any time to remember, it is important to remember that any time there is a development project, the local elites, they just, their eyes just glow. They feel there is a sense of opportunity. But the thing is like, you know, it's not all about elites and new elites or the developmental elites in a country. If we target those particular people who we need to, then we need to find those people who have expertise on relevant thing. If you look at Bangladesh, there's always a group of people who are always invited in some of the key donor meetings, some of the key development meetings all the time. That does not reflect on very well. So in terms of expertise, in my recent article, I have highlighted that the frustration goes on when one partner from Ghanaian country, they were saying, look, it is obvious that we do, they were talking about them, the Ghanaian experts, that we do all the donkey work. We do collect the data, we prepare the draft, but they take all the glory. There are even examples that they do not even mention our names in the report. They are definitely by default the first author. Here, my proposition is that you know, we respect them and we give them sufficient credit and we should not, we just do not treat, treat them like, you know, as if they are our mere inferiors or they're our, like, you know, line, we met line manage them and we have better knowledge. Because some of these are very clear that, you know, we need to be understanding the values they have, the expertise they have, and not to steal from them in terms of stealing, in terms of not acknowledging, in terms of not appreciating, in terms of not giving sufficient and due credit. This is not a good form or terms and conditions for partnering. I'd like to sum up by saying that when you talk and we try to find out like, you know, look, what can be done to partner well, the main message from my experience should be like, you know, let's be friends. In a friendship, we do not treat somebody unequally or in a way that we look down on them. In a friends, in a friendship, we treat them what they believe. Let's not try to work and treat them like a boss or even a patron. The relationship of patron and client relationship does not work for like you know, and in in real every life. If that does not happen in every life, how and why that would work in a like a development partnership? And working as a boss might not work in the same way as well because that's innately a power relationship. The development partnership, the de development is something different from like in you know, everyday corporate business. The partnering meaning treating other colleagues as with humility, with respect, would be good if we can be friends. But of course bearing in mind that there is a focus to achieve particular goals and outcomes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Palash. That was um, really insightful. I think, you know, these building on those um, key cornerstones of respect and humility is something that really came out through through what you were saying and, and also, you know, being open to learning and thinking about, like, who we who we're bringing to the table and who's coming to the table and who's sharing their thoughts as well and thinking thinking through that. Um, so thank you for those those insights. Um, so next we're going to hear from um, Okari Magati. Um, and um, he's a researcher, grant maker and development worker with diverse experience in program design, implementation, resource mobilization and working with a range of individual givers, foundations, multilaterals and INGO partners. Um, Okari supports organizations to develop adaptive theory of change, grant trackers and M&E tools um, to ensure partnerships re remain re respectful and responsive to change while re reaching the intended participants. So welcome, Akari. Thank you for having me. I think I'll reiterate with what uh, Palash was talking about, that partnerships are centered around power. So it's important to deconstruct the power by imbalance, to create a platform of openness and honesty, where the donor and the grantee understand that their core accountability is for eventually the project participant, the person who understands who is going to eventually benefit from the project. 
So what, in my thinking, should we do to enhance good partnership? Number one is uh, we need to develop highly adaptive project theory of changes. So if you develop a highly adaptive pro uh, project theory of change, it means that in design and even in the implementation process period, you allow for small changes that are communicated uh, quickly. If you are to do an activity and you've given money, it means that it is the responsibility of the uh, grantee to be giving you information of what is going on. Uh, adaptive theories of change will also ensure that you're always agile. It's a partnership. So you're agile in decision making, in communication, meaning that any innovative ideas that happen during implementation are always communicated in a balanced way. Because what happens for now is that once you receive money from a donor, there's the fear that I can't say this, I just let me just do what we had agreed initially. And I think we should improve on our communication to ensure that agility in decision making ensures that we are able to innovate and to reach the project participants quickly. The other thing is to be keen and show genuine interest on the context. I understand we do context analysis to understand what is going on, but by understanding genuinely what the context that you're giving money to is, then it means that you are in a position to understand what the government policies are beyond that, to also understand the politics of that particular organization. Because politics in an organization will determine how a project is implemented. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention really quickly beyond understanding the context and having mentioned that in some circumstances, power dynamics within an organization might affect how change occurs in the implementation of a particular project is that we also need to put a bit of money. So a small percentage in any grant towards capacity building of the particular organization. What are their capacity needs? Are we able to support them to improve their capacity? And just going back to what Palash said, if there are any reports that are going out, we ensure that we also add in the individuals who are doing the actual work instead of uh, you know, ensuring that, these, uh, that we are together. So when I say we are together, Ubuntu in Africa is that all of us are doing it for the better good. There's this whole issue around value for money. So everybody will ask you, what is your value for money for this project? We need to understand also that some projects are more, value for money doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be cheap. It means that we have to implement it in the most efficient way. And in giving grants, we also have to think sustainability long-term, right? The other bit is um, how we communicate. There is long emails that um, some of the project participants won't read. And then there's quick text messages, quick WhatsApp messages. How are we with the project? What's going on? That is what you'll expect a friend to do. And partnerships are about friendship. So how is this going? How do we work around this? It means that there is constant two-way learning in, uh, in both in design and in the implementation phase of any particular project. My other request is uh, if we can be able to give slightly longer grants, so post three years. So you give three-year grant, and then you allow for and then you do a responsible exit if you're not going to do, um, to continue funding that particular project. What that means is that even the implementing organization will have time to build their own capacity. And in part of responsible exit means that you also look for other opportunities that you can give to this particular organization to continue with their work when you're not there. Uh, just to finish up, it's important to strengthen monitoring and evaluation processes or systems within an organization. Two ways still, put a small percentage of your grant or of your budget towards m and &E. Up to say 7%, what are the m and &E systems? How are they looking? 
how the reports looking and just beyond the report, what is the qualitative aspect of things? How is everybody generally receiving the project? Finally, still back on responsible exits. If you're funding a partner, don't just wake up tomorrow and leave. It leaves everything in a limbo. You inform them on time that we will be exiting and we will not continue with this funding. And these are the other opportunities available or internally, how can you source to sustain your own projects and your own work? Um, it's good to accept feedback. So it also means besides strengthening the beneficiary feedback mechanisms within a particular project, it's important to strengthen how you receive feedback as a, as a, as a donor. Thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Akari. So what I really took from that was thinking about flexibility and how you can be responsive, but also thinking longer term around capacity building. What's the context of thinking more broadly about what capacity building, what's the context you're operating in, what the long term value you're bringing, sustainability. If you think you may have to leave a partnership, how are you going to manage that? So really thinking more broadly than just about your partnership. And also some around communication, like how you facilitate two-way learning, how you can help support partners to communicate impact, and how you facilitate a kind of culture of, of two-way feedback. So that's what I really took from that. Thank you. Um, so our last speaker is um, um, Vic Mohan um, from Blue Ventures. So Vic's a practicing GP and director of community health at Blue Ventures. Um, conservation. Um, he's the architect of Blue Ventures award-winning health and conservation program and working with communities in Madagascar he led the development of the region's community health service and its integration into the portfolio of Blue Ventures activities from an integrated health and environment program. So over to Vic and he's got some slides to share with us as well. Thanks Vic. Thank you Sarah and thank you everybody for, for inviting me to talk today. I'm going to briefly um, share Blue Ventures experiences of, of partnership working and then move on to the lessons we've learned, which actually very much echo and build on what's, what's already been shared. I love those, those sort of themes of, of friendship and humility. So these are, I'll be sharing very much the same insights um, during my presentation. Next slide, please. So Blue Ventures worked with coastal communities um, in the tropics to rebuild fisheries and protect ocean life. Next slide, please. Um, we, um, we work in, in areas typically where communities are reliant exclusively on the ocean for food and for livelihoods. Next slide, please. Um, these are typical small scale fishers um, whose cultural identity um, is inter intertwined with the ocean, who have limited livelihood alternatives to fishing, and who often have limited access to other basic services such as health and education. Next slide, please. Whilst working in southwest Madagascar with fishing communities, we unearthed a huge unmet need for healthcare and for women's healthcare in particular. So at the request of, of partner communities, we integrated community-based health services into Blue, Blue Ventures pro, um, program of activities, fisheries and, and conservation activities. And what we saw was that as the health of communities improved, they were better able to engage in the complex long-term work of rebuilding fisheries and protecting ocean life. Next slide, please. It, initially, the way we provided services was by training local women to act as community health workers and providing services in their villages. As time has gone on, we've migrated to working with health partners who come and provide services for the communities that we serve. And so the health environment partnership model for delivering this, mod, this approach um, was, was born. And what we found is that the healthcare providers benefit from improving the reach of their health services and the conservation organizations benefit from working with healthier, more engaged communities. Next slide, please. So inspired by this model, we supported the replication of it um, throughout Madagascar. We set up a learning network to enable this model to be replicated where healthcare providers partner with conservation organizations to replicate this health environment approach. Um, and our job is to first facilitate those partnerships to form. Next slide, please. Outside of Madagascar, we identify and work with local NGOs, community-based organizations who are working with fishing communities, and we collaborate with them 
on rebuilding fisheries and, when necessary, integrating health services into their program of, of activities. Um, and, and as, bef and as um, in Madagascar, that's done through partnerships, bringing in healthcare partners. Next slide, please. And as a result of that model, we've now replicated this approach in various countries um, around the rim of the Indian Ocean. Next slide. So thank you. So, so what, what have we learned through this different way of working with partners? Well, well, fundamentally, we've learned that there's no substitute for thorough scoping of an identification of, a, of appropriate good partners. And that doesn't just mean people who are working in the right place doing the right sort of thing. It means people, organizations whose vision and values really closely align with ours. What we found is that when working with, with, with partners whose values don't align, those partnerships haven't flourished. Once we find a, a truly aligned partner, we'll invest in that partnership for the long term. Because we recognize it's these partners, it's not us, that are going to have the opportunity and potential to have sustained impact for the benefit of, of coastal communities and, and ocean life. So we invest in we invest in these partnerships for, for the long term. Um, what, what, that, what that means is we will um, we tailor our approach for, for different partners. We will um, we, will, we will recognize the complementarity of the skills and expertise that we bring and our partner brings, recognizing that, that this is really a two-way learning opportunity. We have so much to learn from our site-based partners, whilst we have technical expertise that we're very happy to share. And we will invest the time in building the trust of that partner, you know, recognizing the centrality of trust in us having a meaningful long-term partnership for sustained impact. Um, and, and we will tailor the support we offer to the needs of that organization. And we will, as I said, we will invest in, we'll invest for long enough to ensure that we will have the, that we're going to have the sustained impact that we share, that, that, that we share, that, that we aspire towards. And that might be providing technical support on fisheries or on healthcare. It might also be um, providing technical support on ME. It might include providing support on fundraising or communications or or, or, or to developing robust data systems. Basically, whatever that organization needs to, to have sustained impact, we will support them to do that. And, and because it's a long-term partnership, we will take all the associated risks associated with investing with, in this partnership for the long-term. What we're trying to do as much as possible is to create a level, level playing field for these and local NGOs for these community-based organizations so that they have because so they have a chance of competing for the sort of funding that UK-based organizations can compete for comfortably. You know, at the moment that is just simply not the case. So we work hard to, to build their capacity so they have a chance of competing for that money, for that attention, for that media attention, for example. Now when they when they're unable to compete um, because they wouldn't pass the due diligence process of some of the funders that we work with, for example, then we will take on that risk. We will subgrant to those organizations and say to others, we have conducted due diligence. We believe these partners can, can have sustained impact. We will take the risk. We will support them to, 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 to get the work done. So we take on the risk ourselves. We act as a conduit for resources and we basically do what we can to level that playing field so that these organizations have a chance of competing and have a chance of fulfilling their potential as having impact. And once we've you know, as we identify these partners and support them to grow and to and to and to and to have impact, we then we then take on the role of convener. We bring the partners together and allow them to learn from each other. We become the facilitator and we form learning networks through which partners can share experiences, learn from each other, and build and build a coalition to have impact, not at project level, but at, but at, but at much greater level. I could talk for hours about this, as you can probably tell. I'll stop now, but we'll be happy to take questions. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Rick. That was really helpful in kind of bringing alive um, some of what we mean when we talk about um, effective partnerships, you know, partnerships that are long term, that are really tailored approach, um, that, that offer broad and complementary support. Um, that's so important. Um, and, the, and and you brought up this, this area, this idea of kind of sharing risk. And I think it's really interesting to look at what risk we place on on um, local partners when we ask when we you know when we work on projects together and what risk we're asking them to bear and how we can balance that risk across um, you know some of our own organisations who are funding organisations and then the part the implementing partners. 
Um, so I think that's a really interesting point to think about as well. So I can see a couple of questions coming up. What I might try and do is take a couple at a time. Um, I can see John put one in the chat a little while ago that I think was there was one answer to that about um, whether the relationships, the kind of breeding of une unequal relationships is more um, an individual. It's, it's often created by individuals or whether it's a kind of broader... Um, NGO approach that kind of creates that in, um, unequal relationship. So maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Um, and then Sadie's asked about tips and advice to ensure the power balance is understood to be equal by both partners. So I think there's a difference between it being equal and it being understood to be equal. I think there's something in that around how, it, how it's viewed. Um, and and just go, going on from that, um, should there always be input from the local partner in capacity building plans? So how do you manage capacity building plans and how do you develop those? Um, so yeah, we can take, I'm just looking down to see if there's more questions, but if, if people can pop questions on in the chat, um, maybe we can take those ones to start with. Maybe we start with a lash around, um, you know, is it an individual or an organization? And also how do we kind of, uh, Thank you. Um, I think I think it's, it's it would be like you know, naive to have a generalization here, and I I have tried to respond this on the in the chat box as well. Um, of course, like you know the there are difference between rhetorics and practice, right? The university and the institutions have their like you know huge and um, great goals, like you know they want to do this and do that. So in some cases, NGOs, INGOs, because is an INGO, for example, is an autonomous um, entity? Probably not. This is collection of like you know, some individuals like you know, who probably work temporarily and who probably like you know, work long term. So on the paper, on paper, on the face of it, INGOs do not tend to promote any of these unequal partnerships. They don't. But in practice, the INGOs, when they try to go for like you know, partnering terms and conditions, and we all know like you know, who devised the terms and conditions. The local partners do not devise the terms and conditions apart from few exceptions of my knowledge. It's mainly like the local partners have to come to terms of the INGOs, right? And um, that's also a broad, broad issue of civil society. They, the way we have manufactured and produced modern civil society that has dem de demolished like you know, many informal um, informal like you know, different community groups or like the you know, cooperatives because they don't have a, like you know, what you call registered bank account that can be monitored. So INGOs need to monitor because of their like funding demands and everything else. So of course, like you know, most often, INGOs on paper do not want to promote such an inequality, but the business in its essence by default is unequal. And then like you know, there are some individuals. And again, as I explained from my respondents perspective, it's not I only do that. I'm sure like many respondents in Global South from different partner organizations, they also know that all of these, like you know, all the stuff from INGOs are not like that. There are some like, you know, what you call exceptions. There are some good people. There are some people who value local ideas, local understanding, and like, you know, the local expertise. But most often there are few, as I said, like, you know, they don't respect it at all. They try to boss them around. And they're just like, you know, just, just clearly show that like, you know, look, you need to work on our terms. You need to do what you are being told. So generalization might not be useful. There are some exceptions, but largely it could be said that INGOs, maybe unintentionally, maybe not on paper, also do this while some individuals also part of this process. Thank you. Thanks. John, did you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, I just wanted to reflect on the idea that um, in my experience, INGOs, um, they compete amongst themselves as organizations, but also what they do is they breed competition within their own staff. So for example, we, we, when you get aid cuts, they go through a process uh, where they say, okay, we're gonna have to cut some of these programs. What are we gonna cut? We're gonna cut the ones that are least impactful. What does that mean? Uh, it certainly, it doesn't uh, uh, adhere to, to the kind of things that Boniface was talking about with adaptive program management. You say, well, your program's not very, well, I'm, I, I'm just adapting it over this period and it's gonna take four or five years to actually make this. A, Sorry, mate, 
we've just got a we've just got an aid cut from the UK government. Your program is now out the door. Somebody else who didn't do any kind of adaptive program management, but says, look at my outputs, they're amazing. They they totally ignore all local context and local partners. That person gets their program maintained under the cut. So it, it, it breeds. That's my question was really about the idea that maybe big NGOs, and I have worked for a couple of them, um, do actually, you know, I think we're also naive to think that they're not competitive within their own, you know, within the regions and within even countries within those regions. So I just wondered whether how we can reorganize uh, or, 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 or just reflect on that. So. Thanks. Maybe we could take a comment from our carry on that. Um, thanks, John. Okay. In my opinion, I think of importance is just to understand why adaptive programming is very important, especially for the for the partners. When you do adaptive programming, it doesn't mean you're not doing anything. It means that you're learning and you're reaching the most vulnerable in the best approach or the best way that the context understands. So when in my thinking, if there are any funding cuts to, to be done should be for those organizations that don't care so much about learning and about adaptive programming, in my opinion. Great, thanks. Vic, did you want to comment on that? And I can see there's another question popped up direct, more directly for you as well in the chat. No, I'm, I don't have anything to add to that. I'm happy to talk about capacity building, if that would be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll move on to that. So, so and this is, this is a really important point. So we, we came into this um, you know, working with partners, naively thinking that all we needed to offer was technical support. And we, and we realized actually that, you know, the, the, the kind of development needs of the partners we're working with are broader than that. And, and so that's been a journey for us. And over, over time, we have we've developed several approaches. Firstly, we have developed a kind of a capacity framework of, that, we, that we think organizations need in order to, to deliver the sort of um, results that we we co-create and aspire towards, you know, between us and our partners. So we have a capacity framework for that. Some of that's technical, some of that might be fundraising, or whatever else. And then, so that's the first thing. And 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 the better the better you can do that, and the better you can codify that, the better I think. Secondly, we then work collaboratively with partners and say, look, th does this make sense to you? W which of these things do you think you're strong at? Which of these things do you think you have to you have the development need in? And which of these things do you disagree with us on that you don't need? And then we, we work collaboratively on a on a organizational development plan that we might support them on, whether we provide this, the, the training or the, or support them to get the funding to, to, to do that. So so sometimes we might offer leadership training for people. Sometimes we offer, as I said, training on M and E. Sometimes we might offer training on fundraising. So but we, we're very much doing it collaboratively because we want to support the organization to take ownership of their development as an organization, right? You know. Take ownership of developing as always, but take ownership of having impact um, that, that last. So, so th there's no point us imposing that. It's about these are our ideas. What, which of this makes sense for you? And and the, I think the better we can codify that capacity development, the better we can, but the better we can justify it to donors that this is what we're doing with your money. We have got we've got robust evidence that we are building capacity of these partners, and they are going to have impact. So, and if we if we codify it robustly, I think that that sort of solves many of the problems that we have about how do we find capacity. Yeah, I think it's really interesting you talk about codifying capacity building because capacity building has been a term that's been so overused and so broadly and not really defined. So I think to really get clear on what your organisation means by capacity building and what it can and can't offer is something that's really really important. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, any other questions? I can't see any specific coming up in the chat. I've actually got um, something I want to ask. So um, I, one of the challenges that I find in, in building our partnerships is the donors that are funding us. So the bigger donors. So I think FCDO is the worst one I've worked with in terms of um, being a being a donor that enables us to build really positive partnerships um, to the, to the organisations that we're working with. I found Big Lottery to be actually really responsive and they've got, I haven't worked with them for a while, but when I did, um, they were really helpful in helping us build broader and better partnerships. Um, but just maybe, a, and I think with, with um, Trust and Foundations, 
I think often trusts and foundations are dealing with so much incoming, uh, so many applications that they're trying to do, process everything at such speed that there may be that most um, grant and trust making organisations are not thinking about how they're helping um, smaller NGOs to, to build overseas partnerships. Um, so maybe just a comment about that around what we as, so my question is, what can we as smaller NGOs um, um, do to um, support larger donors and trusts and foundations to, to help us be better partners? Sorry, that's a bit of a long-winded question. I hope it makes sense. Um, so I don't know whether anyone wants to comment there. I'd, I'd be happy to kick off, Sarah. Yeah. So um, maybe I'm sticking my neck out here, but I think... I think we can take it upon ourselves to lead. Um, and and what, what I mean by that is, you know, do what we can to change the culture, you know, to change, change the funding landscape so that, so that it's, it's becomes the norm to, to take the risk and invest in smaller, you know, community-based or local NGOs. So I think, we, I think we should take it upon ourselves to lead that, to lead that debate. I think some of that will come through, you know, developing long-term relationships with donors, and 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 then we can leverage that trust to, to to invest in these partners in a way that we believe is best. You know, our successes have been greatest when we've leveraged the the the, the funding from partners who trust us and who believe in us. So if I think that probably needs to come first. You know, build build relationships with trusted donors who who get to know you, who get to trust you, who get to believe that you will have impact, and leverage that relationship to slowly change the way we think about how we support, how what we do with this money. Mm -hmm. And and then and then and as I was mentioning in my talk, if we can support coalitions of small organisations, develop learning networks um, of organisations who are who are working towards a shared common purpose. And are having impact at scale when you aggregate the if aggregate the impact of their work, they can then become, you know, they can then self-organize, they can then become grantees as a, as a network, or we can facilitate that. And it then becomes easier for donors to, to, to give money to a group of organizations rather than a very small organization. Yeah. Anyone else got anything to add to that? Palash, do you want to add? Yeah, if I could. Um, I think <clears throat> I slightly like, you know, slightly. I have a slightly different opinion than Vic, and I respect what he says. I think we need to have like you know, an open mind, and we need to be brave enough to tell the truth. We need to walk the walk, not the talk the talk. Right? The case is like you know, I I really appreciate the previous um, speaker. I mean, I forgot his name, who, who was talking about the competition among the international NGOs. It is absolutely vital to remember that, and you also need to recognize that there are competitions among the national NGOs and partnering organizations. Right, there's huge competition that makes this like so. There is a, like there's like there's there's an emerging circle. There's a gang, let's say. There is this part, you know, particular circle of elite organizations who will be always be partnered with like you know, some NGOs, and they are like they will have dinners together. They will have like you know, meetings together. They will have workshops together, and they travel together as well. The reason I say this, like you know, the NGOs need to invest money in exploring this rather than relying on readily available like the toolkits by the academics or like other people or other practicing groups. Different aspects will come, different aspects will work for different NGOs based on the type of businesses and the partnering organization they partner with, right? They need to actually like you know, understand and recognize that you know, as much as these resources are limited, we know from the aid cut and before aid cut and this will happen, this will continue. We know that there are like you know, in competitions among international organizations as much as there are like you know, competitions among like you know, within the national organizations and that again creates an unequal relationship with some of the national elite organizations and some of the like local like let's say some organizations ngos who are like you know, running from the capitals of the like you know, different developing countries and some like you know, local rural ngos who are partner of these people when they outsource their jobs like who become sub partner of that and that creates, breeds another form of unequal relationship. All these need to be taken into consideration to identify what could work for individual or another one particular NGO. Because I'm sure, like, you know, difference, diversity needs to be recognized, and there will be bespoke solutions rather than one or few handful of solutions that will be like you know, implemented or could be implemented as a toolkit. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thanks for sharing that, Panashi. You're really interesting about yeah, just taking care around you know who we're bringing into the room and and how we're kind of creating networks that are reinforcing you know the people who are in the room already so thank you for that and um, I think we're kind of out of time but I might just invite like a one minute closing comment um from each of our speakers um maybe we'll start with Vic and work backwards and um, so Vic do you want to just make um any kind of closing comment um oh on the spot just, <laughs> sorry no no that's okay just, I think for, for us it's important that we remember that it's our local partners are the ones that are going to be having having making a difference for the communities they serve not us you know it's our partners making a difference not us so we need to really work in service to them we need to listen to them work in service to them and you know and develop a shared vision for what we want we want, we want to work towards brilliant thanks Vic. Akari? I think building a culture around good partnership means that we also have to build a culture about how we think about who we are serving. So if you're an international partner, how do you think about the people that you're serving? And what particular change do you want to see? It also means that we have to be brave enough to ensure that we are bringing out case studies and information to the international space or to the international partners, the FCDOs and all that. And we are in the spaces such as Bond Conference and all that, where our case studies are being seen and what things like adaptive programming and stuff are doing to the people who need change happening to them. Because change can never happen in a silo where we are using um, frameworks from 1960 or 1900 to think that change is going to happen in a dynamic way. Because communication now, is very fluid and we have to adapt to the change that is happening. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes, please. I might have frozen. <laughs> if you'd like to revise your remarks. Yeah, I mean, in the one minute closing, it's just like you know, quite tough. But first of all, I'd like to thank Sweden for organizing this. It was a great opportunity to be able to express my views. And I, for the first, I'll be first to say like, no, these are not definitive, right? It would be good to think us from a <clears throat> fair perspective. The common saying <clears throat> that goes on like this, like, no, I'd like to treat somebody the way I'd like to be treated, right? So treat someone the way you'd like to be treated. We are all partnering with many different organizations in various capacities. Would it not be good if we treat others the way we'd like to be treated as a partner organizations? Because we are not like you know, the final say. Many of us, we get funding from other places, other sources, and we know how we would like to be treated in terms of partnership. When we try to like implement this philosophy among our local partners, it would be probably exactly the same thing. We could, we could try and implement the way we like to treat them the way we'd like to be treated with respect, with humility, with open mind, and probably like a possibly a place for sharing common knowledge and expertise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Palash. Um, I think Sarah um, has unfortunately kind of frozen. Um, so I'll just give some closing comments that just thank you so much to all of our brilliant panelists and for such an insightful conversation. And, and thank you to, to everyone who's joined as well for, for continuing this discussion. Um, we just want to kind of bring your attention to our other upcoming events. Um, so later today, we've got um, how to improve diversity in your organization and a meet the funders event as well. Um, and I'm also just going to launch a quick poll, um, if you could just quickly um, answer about how, your experience at the event. And for those of you based in Bristol and the surrounding areas, we'd really love to see some of your faces at our in-person networking event tonight at Bamblan in Bristol City Centre from 7.30 onwards. So just a massive thank you again for all of you for, for coming and speaking and discussing such an important topic. And we hope to see you at some of our events over the next two days as well. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. To be keep in touch with others if anybody wants to get in touch. All right. Thank you.